Okay, and the last little bit from me is I would just like to introduce Geshe Losel. I know some of you know him as Geshe Graham, um, but his correct title is Geshe Losel. And we're very pleased that he's able to come here to Jamyang Leeds today. This visit was planned a long time ago. So we're actually very grateful to Geshe now for being able to offer his teachings in a Zoom format instead today. So he's still available to us. Um, Geshe Losul received full ordination from His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1994. And he studied for seven years, uh, 17 years rather, at the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics in Dharamsala. He received his Geshe degree from Drepung Losaling Monastery in 2006. And he's one of the very few Westerners who's trained in the traditional Tibetan way as a Geshe. He has a deep knowledge of Buddhist texts combined with a great skill in translating and an ability to convey the subtleties of Buddhist thought in ways which we can all easily grasp. And on that note, I shall keep quiet. I've said my bit now and hand over to Geshe Losul. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry I couldn't be with you there in Leeds. It's so close to my own hometown, so, you know, it would have been, uh, I enjoyed visiting in person. That's not been possible. However, um, welcome to Jamsiling International Broadcasting Service, Slovakia, um, with the help of uh, Jamyang Leeds International Broadcasting Service. Um, so it's a... Uh, uh, Jamsiling is a small new retreat center. I don't think it's on any maps. I don't think it's uh, got a website, but it's got a very close association with His Holiness Dalai Lama. So um, it's the right sort of retreat center for me. And I've been uh, sitting out the, well, three and a half months I've been here now. I just came here to teach a couple of courses, uh, but this is where it was very convenient for me to be, um, you know, uh, kind of looked after for all these months when travel's been so restricted. So a big welcome from the heart of Europe. I think we're not, I don't know if we're in the center of Europe, but it feels like it. You know, if you go to the Baltic from here or you go to the Mediterranean from here, or you go to, you know, east, west, to the um, uh, Atlantic coast or North Sea, or you go to the Black Sea, you know, the distances north and south and, or east and west, uh, you know, they're pretty well the same. Not exactly in the center of Europe, but that's uh, just about where we are. So welcome. And uh, our plan is, um, I think in the UK, most people are in the UK. Um, by UK time, it's 10 till 12. Uh, here it's 11 till 1 and then a two hour break for lunch. So then two till four in the afternoon. And then the same again um, tomorrow. But we will have a little break after one hour or so. So uh, just go on for 55 minutes, 50 for 55 minutes and then have a little tea break and then come back until one o'clock. Okay. So also as a beginning, just to say thank you for, for everybody who's made this possible. Um, probably forget to do that at the end, so I do it at the beginning. Um, everybody in Leeds or everybody here who's been so helpful, and other people too, I'm sure, and thank you all for coming and listening. Okay, so that's that then. Um, so it's nice to start off with a, with a bit of chanting, I always think, but uh, that doesn't seem to come across so well on uh, Zoom, you know. You can't really hear other people's voices while you can hear your own voice. So uh, we'll keep the chanting fairly short. But uh, there is one sheet uh, with the chants on, and I hope you've got it. Prayer list or something it's called. Uh, what's the name of the document, Jason? I can't remember the name of the document exactly. Which, which one are you referring to? The, uh, the, the prayers on. The jam selling one. 
It probably says jam selling or something, yeah. Yeah, there's a document that says, um, well, there's a four seals chant document. Is no, it that? The one we used last week, you know, the, the one we used with the Buddha Palita course. Yeah, four seals online course, jam selling 2020 prayers. I'll put it back in the chat so people have it. So you got it. Did everybody hear, Jason? How can you find it? So it's just a few prayers to chant, right? Um, it's not the whole big document about the four seals or anything. Everybody got it? So what we're going to do at the beginning is a refuge and bodhicitta. Uh, and these three homages to three great texts. So Refuge in Bodhicitta, um, first in a, a local language, a bit of local colour. The local language here is Slovak or Slovensky or whatever they call it, but uh, we don't have any prayers that are uh, chantable translated into that language, so we're using Czech language. So that's just next door, very, very similar. And then uh, English and Tibetan. Then the three homages, if you look down the page, one is by Nagarjuna, so that is the homage to his uh, fundamental wisdom stanzas. And then um, the one by Lord Maitreya is the homage to the ornament for clear realizations. Um, another text that is very much studied in the Geshe program and so on. And another text, that, and the last one is by Master Dharmakirti, so that's his commentary on valid cognition. So that again is another text greatly loved in the uh, Dalai Lama tradition, uh, one of the classics, Indian. Uh, text. So just uh, chant those things. And we have a we have a chant master in Czech, so <laughs> let's hope it sounds good. <laughs> Sloučkě dosti a veště rozností, jež pro druhé budoucí rozsáhnu. To bude dáma en pán veloším, a jdou poreť už tyhle majtrment, by my collections giving and the rest. To perfect Buddha I bow down, supreme of teachers, he who taught, defending relativity, Without cessation or arising, or severance or permanence, no oneness and no separateness, no coming and no going forth, the end of fabrication is free. The good of things achieve the world so far, unwell and that way to the sage seat. On this so aspected variety, I bow down to the mother of the Buddha. And here are those who sat for companies. This further. Of the nets of thought, with bodies that profound and vast, to you whose pure light shines afar, in total goodness I bow down. Thank you very much. So what's the message of those chants? You know, what's, um, what are we really uh, 
Well, where, how do we tune in? You know, we can do a bit of meditation here, tuning in, but um, I haven't got that much time. I want to press ahead to get into the real sort of, uh, you know, the subject of our talks. But if we really um, say, well, what is the essence of what we are? Um, what those titis, what those um, uh, homages and so forth, what are they pointing towards? Well, the message is very complex, very deep, very profound, of course. So um, just um, one point that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, uh, Buddha's energy is pervading the universe at all times. That's how I like to picture it. Now, why should Buddha be respect, uh, restricted by uh, time and place? We are restricted by time and place. And I think that's because we have the bodies that we do. Our minds potentially have, um, you know, uh, an expansiveness and a profundity uh, equal to the Buddhas, potentially. But our bodies restricted to, restrict us to here and now. But uh, Buddha is, um, you know, uh, way beyond that. So our point in doing, or one point in doing these, um, these prayers at the beginning is to try and connect with that that sort of Buddha force, that's, um, that Buddha inspiration, that is, um, you know, whatever, it's, it's all around us. And uh, most of the time when we're doing practical tasks, a person like me, you know, dumb, dumb to a person like me, you just forget that. And so we, we lose the inspiration and we just get uh, busy with our things. But uh, at this time when we have come together in this virtual meeting, I don't know where we are, I'm in Central Europe, you're in uh, probably most of you in Western Europe or Northern Europe. We have one lady from uh, Finland, perhaps. Yes, yeah, so welcome uh, to Hanali if she's here with us. So, um, where's the meeting taking place? In sort of some sort of cyberspace or something? <laughs> Whatever that is. Well, that's maybe where just where Buddha is. He's in cyberspace, you know, he's not localized in one place and time. So he's, he's, um, uh, he's where this meeting is, you know, in all places at all times. <laughs> or no place of no time. So, you know, beyond all death, beyond all night, one vast illimitable light. So that's um, just one, two lines from the poem uh, called Nirvana. Beyond all death, beyond all night, one vast illimitable light. We're just trying to raise ourselves up to, you know, a bit nearer the Buddha level in our consciousness. So that was a poem written um, on Nirvana, Nirvana is one of the subjects of our talk, you see, um, and that was written in the Buddhist Review, which is Britain's oldest Buddhist journal, I believe, uh, uh, for the issue, which was April, May, June, 1914. I'm not saying it's great poetry, you know, just beyond all death, above all joy that we can say, beyond all death, beyond all night, one vast, illimitable light, very simple stuff, but you know, uh, this is this is one English man, I presume, trying to picture Nirvana to himself. And note that that, in, that issue came out, you know, um, and only in the next month, 28th of July, 1914, the First World War began. Four years, three months, and 14 days of total war for, um, you know, uh, uh, the parts of Europe that we're familiar with and many other places. So, um, you know, on the one hand, our, our refuge and our homages help us, you know, open in our inner way to, uh, you know, the Buddha, whose pure light shines afar in goodness, total goodness. But we need it because we're up to the neck in samsara. We're, uh, samsara is always playing its, um, it, it, it's unhappy tricks. And I think, you know, we always think of maybe the world, the First World War as one of the worst tricks. But isn't something just as bad coming our way now, you know, with uh, all this climate crisis? You know, it's, um, it, it could be quite, uh, you know, um, quite a heavy time, let's say, to say the least. I think you had um, uh, Andy, Andy Wistrich, was he? In your on your Zoom program just recently, did you organise that, Lynn? Uh, he's actually going to be teaching here in October, so he's he's not taught here just recently. He has okay. in the past, and he will be again in October. But the Zoom thing was uh, on you know the climate crisis. 
wasn't it? Oh yes, yes. We had um, we have an eco dharma group at um, Jamyang Leeds, yeah, and a... the, on June the twentieth there was a presentation which he made to that group. So yes. Yeah. So just uh, I just found that on YouTube. So I'm, I'm looking forward to listening to that. Yeah. So, you know, even us, you know, white, the white Westerners in the most privileged lot in all the species and all the kind of, you know, um, um, varieties of humanity, you know, the most privileged, and the most, the most sort of satisfactorily well off, the white Westerners, even for us, you know. And we can say we've been born, we can say we've been born, you know, at the peak of Western civilization's power and prosperity. So who could have it? Who could have, who could have it more better than we've got it? And yet, you know, um, things are looking very precarious, even for you know, the, you know, the, even for the top class, the top dogs. So if anybody is comfortable, they ought to be us. But you know, gross suffering is never far away, and subtle suffering is always with us. Subtle suffering, yeah. It's, that subtle suffering. My body. <laughs> yes. That's the question. Is my body, is that really subtle suffering? Who's, who, what's, what's the sense in causing, call, calling your body suffering? Good question. But subtle impermanence leads to subtle suffering, understanding of subtle suffering. Can we get that far? So we see even our body as subtle suffering. Well, maybe somebody don't, some people don't have any trouble at all. They think of their body as suffering. Somebody, when you get as old as me, you start to realize. Anyway, that's uh, jumping ahead. All I'm saying is, you know, we need uh, the Buddhist teachings um, as never before. And let our search not be just for, you know, temporary um, uh, a kind of simple happiness that just um, arises and pass away, passes away, you know, on, on the samsaric level. But let our search for happiness be, you know, the, the long-lasting happiness, you know, the search for a deeper kind of fulfillment. And let it not just be for ourselves. Uh, you know, if all the, the troubles and the trials of the world teach us something, they should teach us love. So as long as we're getting that message, then, uh, you know, we, we are, uh, to that extent, we're making progress. So we have to broaden ourselves out now to think not just about our own, um, you know, concerns, our own aspirations, our own anxieties, but, you know, let's take on board, um, you know, the well-being of all. And we are the most privileged section, the most privileged species, the most privileged section of that species. So, you know, um, uh, it is our responsibility. We've got the wealth and the power in our societies. So, you know, we're the ones that are wrecking the world, right? We're the ones who are putting out all the carbon uh, emissions above, above and beyond any other society in the world, you know. So, um, I'm, I'm just quoting a couple of verses from Shantideva uh, just to bring in the, you know, the compassion side, the, the bodhicitta side. It's not much mentioned in the text that is the subject of our uh, talk. So we have to make um, a little diversion onto a bit of uh, Shantideva for uh, a few verses of inspiration from that side. So I'm choosing uh, chapter 8, verses 85, 90, and 94. But they're not on any of your handouts. This is just, um, you just have to listen to these. So verse 85. So fed up by our, fed up by our continual desire, let us now rejoice in solitude, in places empty of all conflict and defilement, the peace and stillness of the forest. Can you hear me okay, by the way, Jason? Is it coming across clearly? Yeah? Okay. So, um, we're not in the forest. Well, we, we here in Jamsaling, we are in the forest. It is a very beautiful environment of forest and a, a meadow, ancient meadow with lots of uh, beautiful wildflowers. So we're okay. But you guys in Leeds and places. But anyway, you know, um, by coming into a, to a Dharma talk, like, it's, like, it's as if we're in the forest, right? It's as if we've retired from, um, you know, the business of uh, ordinary daily life, and we are, um, you know, having a space together 
to think and reflect, you know, in peace and, uh, you know, in quiet. So that's the point of that verse. So let's use that. And then verse number 90. Number 90. Strive at first to meditate upon the sameness of yourself and others. In joy and sorrow, all are equal. Thus be guardian of all as of yourself. So it's just reminding us, you know, that um, all of us want happiness. All of us, all of us want, um, you know, freedom from um, anxieties and, and pains and, and stresses. Yeah, so we're all just like that. Uh, even the little birds that have been born this year, you know, and they're just learning uh, the joy of flight that are um, whizzing around this uh, cabin where we are. Uh, plenty of birds here. And you see the juvenile birds are coming out of their nests and really learning how to fly and feeding like crazy, you know, just like um, young teenagers scoffing lots of food. <laughs> so they, and they're not so good at flying actually, you know, we have, we've had several, they hit the windows of, of this uh, house, you know, uh, at tremendous force and some of them even kill themselves. It's very sad, you know, they're, they're just learning how to fly. They're just learning the, the pleasure of, of having wings and then they just crash into some glass window and even kill themselves. You know, I think we've buried about three, it's very sad. So you can see that uh, um, all of us are just struggling in, in, in the same, uh, you know, in the same direction, the same aspiration for happiness. Uh, so, you know, um, putting ourselves as more important than in anybody else is just, um, uh, you know, it's just completely um, self-centered, it's completely um, selfish, no um, kind of um, real justification for it. Oh, well, if I've got to look after myself, nobody else is going to look after me. You know, you can get very uptight about yourself. But in fact, you know, when you think about it, everybody else, if you've got any human rights, everybody else has got rights the same as you. How are your rights more than important than anybody else's? Of course, they're not. Just a reminders about, us, uh, a reminders about that. And then number 94 then, going a little bit beyond that, in our aspiration, verse number 94. Therefore, I'll dispel the pain of others, for it is simply pain, just like my own. Others I will aid and benefit, for they are living beings, like my body. Yeah, so don't, um, don't just think of your pain as special, just, just to develop that state of mind where anybody's pain is like, um, um, personally like unsatisfactory to you. Anybody's pain, just try to beat it like your pain. It's not like it's actually going to damage your body, this pain, but you know, oh, that pain must be relieved because it is pain just like my own. That's enough. So that's the idea. Um, just as I, I treasure my own body and try to look after it and make sure that it is comfortable, then other beings are just like that. They're not part of my body, but they are in the same way as my body, living things, very sensitive very vulnerable to pain, so let me um, uh, really dedicate myself to um, working uh, to dispel the pain of others, not just me, the big me. So that's um, just a um, general bit of inspiration, a general bit of, um, kind of uh, you know, we're trying to be practice Buddhism in the Dalai Lama tradition, so very important to stress this, uh, the universal attitude. Um, so um, what we've got here in this text is more like a text which is like common to all kind of um, uh, Buddhist traditions. So whether you're studying Buddhism in uh, Thailand or Burma or, you know, Vietnam, Japan, um, different places like that, Mongolia, whether it's Mahayana Buddhism or Buddhism of other traditions, you kind of would expect to find these, these um, the four seals of our topic today mentioned. I don't know if that's um, completely true, but it's um, very much a, uh, I don't know. Going beyond just our, you know, Dalai Lama tradition of Buddhism, definitely you, you find these texts mentioned in uh, uh, these, uh, these principles mentioned much more widely than that. So rather than discuss, you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, add-ons of compassion bodhicitta in this text, not mentioning them, it's so more of a, 
a general presentation. Uh, so um, we'll go on to the text now then. But it, now and again, we'll just um, sprinkle in a few of these uh, verses of Shantideva. I think we need them, you know. I call them uh, love bombs, Shantideva's love bombs. At uh, Sakadawa here, we had we had made, we made Dalai Lama love bombs. You know, Sakadawa to celebrate uh, Dalai Lama's enlightenment, but they are edible love bombs. Shanti Davis, uh, love bombs aren't edible, I'm afraid, but uh, they're very good to uh, uh, spread about sometimes. Anyway, so our text. If you've got some, uh, if you've got the actual um, main text that. Uh, we are supposed to talk about today. Um, the author is Gen Lan Rinpa Ngawang Punso. He's a Tibetan who never left Tibet. Born in Tibet, of course, never left. 1922 to 1997. So he's um, just uh, came across his text when I was looking for, you know, other help on other with other things, but found it to be very, um, you know helpful for me, very illuminating. And uh, so I, I eventually I got around to translating it. Um, one connection I have is that uh, my first teacher in England at the old Manjushri Institute in uh, uh, Cumbria, in the Lake District, um, an old teacher from Draper Loseling, um, who's passed away now, uh, and um, he left um, the uh, Manjushri Institute in Cumbria, you know, when things became obvious that it, that it wasn't com comfortable to be there anymore, you know, he left and went back to India, to Drepung. Uh, but he was a classmate of um, uh, Gen Larimba, so he knew Gen, Gen Larimba quite well and knew, knew how um, sort of a dedicated a practitioner Gen Larimba was, you know. He wasn't one of your average monks who just, um, you know, uh, um, sort of did the studies and passed and got a degree. He was somebody who was very, really keen on practice and really took a lot of risks in, in, the, in the really heavy days of the Cultural Revolution to keep a bit of Dharma going in, uh, in, in Lhasa. He was in prison for some time, but he wasn't one of those guys who was in prison for you know, 20 years, and some sort of huge, long prison sentence. But um, you know, he, was, he lived all through the, the heaviest times uh, when the Chinese were really um, eradicating any sign of the Buddhist or Tibetan culture. So somehow he survived all that and, uh, you know, kept things going. Um, so um, he was a, must have been a very special character somehow, but very good karma, I don't know. And uh, so that's my, um, you know, my connection to this, this lost generation. You see, the people who, who did get their, their education in Tibet or most of their education in Tibet at the old, uh, in the old big monasteries. So, um, you know, that's, um, that's something, you know, to have this, this little link, you know, to, to things just before uh, things crashed into ruins in Tibet, you know, the old ways of, uh, and the old days. It's, it's kind of um, satisfying to think that I've got this little connection through my teacher and people like Gen Lamempa. So the, the, the title then is A Glowing Light of Scripture and Realization. Sorry. A glowing, light, a glowing light of scripture and reasoning. Lamp illuminating the essentials of the four seals that authenticate the view. You can always be sure with Tibetans that they love a long title. They don't give their books little <laughs> short titles. Uh, it always has to be like um, very flourishing, and very, uh, uh, what a grand, very grand title. <laughs> But the point is, it's the four seals, you see, the four seals that guarantee the view, the four seals that, that um, you know, if the four seals are there, then you can be pretty sure that this is um, a presentation of the Buddha's view. And if four seals are not there explicitly, but there's nothing contradicting the four seals, then, you know, you can be sure that this is um, uh, something that's authentic. And uh, the, uh, the, um, the name seals, it comes from... It's not from the animals who, who, who were swimming through the water um, 
pulling somebody along. Uh, not, not, not the animal seals, but the, the seals that you get on a king's document. So when you've got these four seals, uh, you know, it's like the, the king has all this, this um, ring, you know, with a, with a stamp on his ring or something, or he has a, a stamp, like at the head office of the corporation, there's a stamp that goes on a letter. And that shows that uh, this is, uh, you know, the genuine article. So this is the, the word of the king. So you have to obey it. So that's the four seals like that. It's the presence of those four seals reassures you that this is, you know, the real deal. So what are the four seals then? Okay, and, and let's, uh, let's just get on to the um, actual teaching. So we have the um, we have the the verses on the four seals called the four seals chant, which is at the beginning of the text, and also it's been sent to you separately. So those are composed by me, so they're not by Ken Rinpa. And then you, the the the, um, the actual text by Ken Rinpa starts on the next page. So usually, it, or, or uh, a, a traditional kind of way of doing things in the Tibetan and Sanskrit tradition is you write a very condensed verse summary of your ideas. It may be quite long, but it's still pretty condensed, you know. And these people like Nagarjuna and uh, the Lord Maitreya and uh, Dharma Kirti, you know, the, 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 the Indian masters we've already mentioned, you know, that they, they wrote a very tight and quite difficult to understand a short verse summary of their views, which the students, I guess, are supposed to memorize. And then they write a, a, a kind of a, a prose commentary. They write a, an explanation of what all these tight, condensed, uh, difficult to understand verses actually mean. So that's what they give when they, you know, that's what they give to the, their, their um, discourse, you know, their explanation when the students are sitting around them in a circle listening, having memorized the verses. Well, Gen, Ram, Gen Lam Rinpa didn't do that. You know, he, he wrote the prose text. He wrote the, uh, um, the, the, the main text here, and I came along and wrote a, a, convert, a, a condensed verse summary of the text. So it's a bit cheeky of me, really. But, uh, and it's the wrong way around. First, I guess you, you know, the teacher writes the verse text and then he explains it. But I've, I've, I've added this, uh, my verse summary to um, Gellin Rinpa's, uh, you know, fascinating text. So why do we want to study the four seals then? That's the first question. Why should we bother? Well, a little answer comes in the first two verses of the four seals chants, though that, that should be the first verses which are in italics, which are actually by Gendlan Rinpa. So that I'm using two of his verses to introduce my verses, which I'm going to read now. Uh, I hope you can find them. Everybody got them? So it's through Lama's kindness, this time they're revealed. Through Lama's kindness, this time they're revealed. It's look at the four seals chant at the beginning of the text or on the separate paper. And the first two verses are in italics. Okay, so that introduction, yeah? I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the first two verses. Through Lama's kindness, this time there revealed the foes that harm, the fourfold grasping at, the pure, the pleasant, permanence and self, who will not take the steps to stop all that. A person who's possessed of sense will not do down this short life's enemies, but still ignore the ones that last from life to life. Ought they not to be stopped with all our skill? So that's um, Gellerinba talking about what? He's talking about ignorance, yeah? We don't talk about enemies in this life, you know, who are big heavy guys, wave, you know, waving uh, Kalashnikovs and things. Yeah, we all know about that kind of enemy. Or the enemy who's like just, um, you know, um, uh, kind of exploiting or corrupt and, you know, politicians who are kind of, you know, stealing the wealth of, of, the, of, of the people for themselves and so forth. We have, we have enemies, you know. People who are, you know, bother, bother us and make us really scared in this life. But they are only enemies for this life. 
But here we're talking about a different kind of enemy, a more kind of, you know, deeper kind of sort of, um, uh, a more kind of um, a long lasting kind of um, uh, opponent to our happiness. And uh, what is that enemy? He says, well, he's got, he's got four of them. The fourfold grasping, you see. When we talk about ignorance, you know, which I hope some uh, people of you, most of you, I'm sure actually, are kind of, um, you know, what's the cause of psychic existence? Well, it's ignorance, isn't it? Yeah. So um, let's have Nagarjuna's verse on that. What does he say? Hold on a minute. Nagarjuna verse coming up. Chapter 26. Chapter 26, verse 1 and 2. So Nagarjuna's uh, fundamental wisdom standards, there's one chapter on the 12 links of, 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 um, 12 links of existence, the 12 links of uh, dependent arising. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, where is samsara coming from? Why do we plunge into all the suffering in birth after birth, life after life? And what's the way out? You know, how can you steer yourself out of it? So he says, um, 26, 1, 2, through being obscured by ignorance, by karma, that's the doing of three types of deeds for being reborn, the one who migrates, migrates on. By deeds conditioned, consciousness emerges in migratory worlds. Once consciousness is entered in, then name and form come to exist, and so on, you know. So that's how the, the process of being, you know, reborn in cyclic existence um, is going on and on. Yeah, and the first line is through being obscured by ignorance. Our minds are kind of, you know, bright. Our minds have the Buddha potential. Our minds have, you know, the illumination of the sun. Self-illumination. But under the sort of, you know, the oppressive gloom of ignorance, you know, with... We, that, 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 that sort of superb potential of ours is hidden away, hidden even from us, never mind hidden from other people. So we sink under that darkness, don't we? And uh, we don't even realize what the possibilities are until we've you know, really kind of sort of uh, had a good insight into emptiness or something. So that's it being obscured by ignorance and then obscured by that ignorance, then we get into the, you know, the, um, the whole samsaric kind of... Uh, uh, kind of um, effort to, to find happiness, but never quite succeeding. You know, we work hard to, to, to find some comforts in this life, but they're only the comforts of this life. And they don't, they don't lift that kind of, you know, um, fog or gloom of darkness, uh, to, so we can really see what we're doing. Uh, now we know what's going on, you know. So that, that takes, uh, you know, the input of our, you know, learning about Buddha's wisdom. Anyway, so that's all I'm just saying, you know, through, then through karma, through t three types of deeds for being reborn, you know, there's, a, there's the, the good deeds, the bad deeds, and there's the deeds that get you into the, um, those realms of high concentration called the unmoving karma. So I'm not going to explain what that is now, but three types of deeds for being reborn, the one who migrates, migrates on, from life to life, by deeds conditioned, consciousness emerges in migratory worlds. So it's through our karma, through our ignorance, then we have karma. Then conditioned by that karma, you know, like determined by that karma, we are, we are thrust into our, our next life. And our consciousness is all bright and, and, and willing to understand anything, very curious. But, you know, we get, we get thrust into, we emerge in a world. We migrate to another world and we have to start making sense of it all over again. You know, so that's um, the way samsara works. So once consciousness has entered in, so that's when, when consciousness has entered into conception, yeah? then name and form come to exist. And name and form means the other aggregates. You've got your conscious aggregate joining up with your form aggregate, basically. So name and form is name is the, uh, the consciousness aggregate, or conscious, consciousness aggregates, and form is, the, uh, form is the form aggregate. So joining up. And you've got a new life or starting all over again. So that's it. So ignorance is like the, um, the, the, the key issue here. And uh, if we're saying, well, what kind of ignorance? We can say ignorance, grasping things to inherently exist. 
So what does that mean? Well, that takes a bit of explaining. Grasping at ourselves to exist in a way that we don't, grasping ourselves to be real people, you know, existing just by way of our, by way of our own power and so forth, instead of being merely dependent arisings, near imputations by mind and so forth. Got to understand dependent arising very clearly, then you can understand uh, emptiness and be freed from um, you know, these illusions and delusions and confusions. So that's the way it is. Ignorance is, is, is the main kind of, you know, the main thing we're pointing at. That's the problem. Now, if you talk about one ignorance, you talk about the ultimate, the, the ignorance of the ultimate. So that's the ignorance of you know, grasping at things to inherently exist. If you talk about two ignorances, then you talk about the ignorance, you know, on the ultimate side, not understanding that we are free of inherent being, not understanding that we are, you know, free of existing in any way, you know, by way of our own power. And then that's the ultimate one. Then the conventional one is mainly one. The main one there is ignorance of karma. You know, people make all sorts of foolish mistakes in this life, not going along with the doctrine of karma. You put out happiness, happiness come back, comes back to you. You know, you put out trouble and hassle for other people, and then, you know, just trouble and hassle will come back to you. You know, that the mind, uh, the mental side of the universe and the form side of the universe are kind of intertwined, you know. It's not like the two separate things. You know, what you do on the mental level eventually translates or can translate onto the physical level, you know, and, uh, you know, basically what you're putting out is what you're going to get back. So ignorance of karma is, is kind of, you know, a huge ignorance, which, um, you know, we have to sort of dispel and learn, you know, it's very much worth doing virtuous, positive, kind actions. It pays in the long run, not just helping other people, but helping yourself. And, you know, negative actions, they might be very tempting and very, um, you know, uh, sort of a, a following your desire and attachment, but, you know, restrain yourself, you know, avoid harming others, avoid disrespecting the brother avoid disrespecting the buddhas you know avoid negative karma then your future prospects are much better but that's two you see two two ignorances but here we've got four ignorances oh no four ignorances yes that's what lama that's what uh is talking about through through lama's kindness this time they revealed the foes that harm, the fourfold grasping at the pure, the pleasant, permanent, and self, who will not take the stops, the steps, to stop all that. So these teachings about the four seals, in a way, and, and uh, you know, when traditionally presented, they are antidotes to these four mistaken graspings. Graspings at the pure, the pleasant, permanent, and self. And so, again, I remember his last verse again. A person who's possessed of sense will not do down this life's, this short life's enemies, but still ignore the ones that last from life to life. Yeah, what's the point, you know? You fight against this life's enemies, they have victory in this life, you know? And, 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 and whatever that means, you know, your satisfaction, pride, or, you know, power, or money, or, you know, um, all the objects of desire that you wish for in this life, you, know, you struggle for those and sweat and slave, you know, looking after the body of this life. Uh, uh, but then, what's the point of doing all that if you're not thinking about, you know, what about the lives to come, the future? So then, um, don't uh, ignore the ones, the enemies that last from life to life. So this is your, you know, underlying ignorance. The body dies, but the mind goes on. So this ignorance goes on with you in your life. So. Uh, this is the ignorance we've now got to tackle. Ought they not to be stopped with all our skill? Yes. How? Okay, well, first we've got to identify them. What are these ignorances he's talking about? Yeah, well, um, if you'd like to turn to the first page of the text then, on page nine, then uh, we'll, we'll get to these uh, um, four points and the four antidotes. Okay, so um, let's um, just uh, go through those, and then we can maybe have a little uh, tea break. Mm -hmm. 
So let me read um, just a little bit from Gellerimpa's text here. Uh, just this um, first page, page nine. I hope you've got the right page. It's the first page of the prose text. Um, it's um, not going to have much chance today of reading a lot of Gellerimpa's text, you know. So I'm just taking this chance to, to read at least one page. We've got to sort of jump around and just give a general summaries and so forth. But uh, we'll read uh, at least the, the first page together anyway. So, Namo Guru, I bow to the Guru. Mm -hmm. So now the first two verses are, I think, just praise to Manjushri, praise to Tsongkhapa, praise to Vijru Guru, um, you know, one nature with Manjushri. A sphere of noble qualities grown full, beneath whose power dark defects never thrive. Sweet Lord, whose smile shines forth in helpful deeds, your moon of speech I worship with my crown. What confidence have I that I can loose the knot of the four seals on reason's path? I'll not take refuge just in scripture, though. With factual reasoning, I shall analyze. So let's get down to it, the four seals. Not just by giving quotes from the Buddha's teachings, but we've got to think about it a bit. So then the pros. In that regard, the four false graspings of the pure, the pleasurable, the permanent, and the to self are responsible for the suffering of embodied beings wandering in cyclic existence. Well, this is where our troubles are coming from. By mistaking the impermanent to be permanent, the impure to be pure, what is suffering to be happiness, and what is selfless to be a self, we in this way become attached and cling to outer and inner phenomena and accumulate various evil actions as the effect of which we have to experience these varieties fear suffering for a long time. They do not arise without a cause, nor from an inappropriate cause. So, if we want definitely to be free from suffering, we must abandon the four fallacies. Therefore, we must meditate thoroughly on their antidotes, impermanence and so forth, and at least lay down whatever imprints we can. For this purpose, I have engaged in some slight analysis here. Here then there are four. Compounded things are impermanent. Contaminated phenomena are suffering. The aggregates are selfless. Nirvana is peace. Yeah, so, um, let's say we'll have, a, we'll have a tea break at five to 12, yeah? So this is, um, you know, in four minutes time, we'll take, take tea. So we're just um, just going to start on these uh, um, uh, four wrong views. Me five, five to eleven, sorry, for the UK. Yes, thank yep. you. Cool. Well, we haven't really got time to start on this. <laughs> yeah. So we've got precious human rebirth, right? So um, as as just as precious humans, then. We've got to have a precious human tea break from now, now and again. So that's uh, what we're going to do next. Anybody got a question? Uh, you, you can ask right now. We've just got three minutes. Anybody, anybody missing anything that uh, I've been saying? Okay, good. So um, just um, take 10 minutes then for a, for a, for a, a cup of tea. And, and see you uh, shortly. Do we come back at 11 o'clock? Is that right? Yeah. Well, 11 o'clock our time. Yeah, just, just a bit after, yeah. yeah okay. So a couple of minutes after. Two minutes past 11. Two. Lynn, you, you'll leave this link on, will you? Just I will, yes. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to, to close the meeting. So, you know, if people want to stay and talk, they can. Otherwise, you can switch your um, video and mute your sound and go and get a drink, whatever you want to do. So, okay. But I will, I will stop the recording, so don't worry. That's stopped. Okay. Thanks. You can make some tea. Thank you. So really, we should just um, try to put some colour on those um, 
all those four types of grasping which we're criticizing as being really um, interfering with our happiness then then we get onto the four seals you know understanding the four seals as the four kind of understandings or wisdoms which um, guide us in the right direction I mean I think the the main idea of our program today is today we talk about in, uh, impermanence more than anything else the first of the four seals you know all conditioned phenomena are impermanent so that's um, got some uh, interesting parts there and then the the second day tomorrow we'll talk mostly about nirvana which again I think is something which maybe say something that maybe you've not not heard about you know nirvana i don't know it's not a subject that's quite so so often um discussed or explored i don't know so um i thought those two be two of the most interesting uh, of the four seals to uh, uh take a glance at take a look at um you know just we can't hope, possibly hope to do them all and it's a long text and it's got some difficult bits in it you know it's got bits in which people who, if they've studied a bit of the Geshe program or done a bit of the debating topics, then you can see how these things are being discussed. But for people who haven't got that background, then, you know, there's, there's um, definitely big pieces of the text which are you know, going to be too tricky. So we're just going to, you know, just um, pick on bits that, that hopefully will be useful and, uh, you know, and sort of inspiring and starting off with impermanence. But, uh, before that, you know, just to, just to give this overview of these four um, uh, critical kind of uh, uh, misunderstandings and then the, the four antidotes in general. So grasping at the impermanent to be permanent. Well, we all know things are impermanent, but do we really grasp at things to be permanent? Well, I think unconsciously we do. Um, and uh, the common... In one that comes to mind just um, in, the, in, in, in the last decades is these people who deny climate change. You know, some of them are, are, are really you know, being very cynical and they know it's happening, but they're pretending it isn't because um, it would interfere with their profits, short-term profits. But other people are really trying to pretend it's not happening. You know? And I don't just mean rich people who are, uh, you know, are kind of interested in, in making money out of selling, you know, lots and lots of barrels of oil or something. But, you know, just ordinary people who, who aren't getting anything, any profit by denying climate change, but they're just denying it because it's an inconvenient truth. So they just want to ignore it, don't they? The world is changing, changing in a very dangerous direction. And, uh, you know, possibly if we'd done something about it a few decades ago, we might have softened the impact. But, um, you know, through people being determined to pretend it's not happening and those people, you know, quite sufficient numbers because they, they, they elect governments who, who are also willing to, you know, deny climate change. So um, that's just an example, you see, I'm trying to find of, you know, when people want to go on things or things, things just go on as they are. And if I believe they'll go on as they are, then perhaps they will, you know, which is, you know, just one form of grasping the impermanent to be permanent. If we want to have peace and happiness in this world, always be ready for change. You know, that, that's where detachment comes. If it's, if it's good, if it's pleasant, if it's happy, let it be, you know, that's cool. But don't be attached thinking, oh, it'll always be like this. You know, if I have more of the same, it'll, it'll give me the same pleasure. It's, it's often not the case. You know, just in any relationship or even just eating chocolate, more of the same. Is it going to give me the same amount of happiness? No, the first two, three pieces of chocolate will give you some happiness, but if you go on and on eating it, it doesn't give the same pleasure. It turns it to the opposite, doesn't it? So grasping the permanent, the impermanent to be permanent. And in grasping the impure to be pure. So this may be mainly refers to our bodies, I don't know. Um, you know, even when we're young and strong, which is not the case in life, personally, but even if, you know, our bodies still have this real mixture of being, you know, glamorous and attractive, but also, um, you know, gruesome, you know, horrible, even if we're not sick. If we are sick and we are injured, badly injured, then we'll know how, how horrible it is to have a body like this. But even when we're not um, sick and we are perfectly healthy, still the body has these um, 
disturbing element, you know. It's only nice on the outside, isn't it? But oh, we're just concentrating on the outside and ignore the inside bits, you know, that don't look so pleasant. So your, your, your focus is very selective. And, um, you know, something that is when you get down to it, pretty impure and, and the root of our, you know, a lot of our subtle suffering, um, you know, we go on just happy to, to consider it from another perspective as something, you know, um, pure and uh, uh, very attractive and desirable. And it's the same with the food I, we eat, I think. You know, if you're a meat eater, I'm thinking, especially, you know, if you really think of what's going on in the slaughterhouses or you go in, what's going on in those places where, you know, chickens are intensively reared in very, you know, um, you know factory-like condition, uh, and then you try to eat some chicken meat, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult. But you selectively ignore all the, the impurity of the, uh, you know, uh, modern industrial farming and the slaughterhouse and you just concentrate on how nice your, your uh, meal is that you're having, your nice restaurant, oh, this food is so tasty, you know. But it's something, there's a very impure dimension to, to you, you, you getting that piece of nourishing meat on your plate, a very impure dimension that you selectively ignore. So that's, you know, grasping the, in grasping the, the, um, the impure to be pure. And the third one that uh, is identified is grasping suffering to be happiness. Sorry. Yeah, so, so, so the, yeah, the suffering of the world, you know, um, uh, grasping at it to be happiness. Okay, we're not talking about, you know, gross suffering. If somebody's got a broken leg, nobody's gonna grasp that as happiness. Well, not, not only in some very unusual circumstances, but the subtle suffering, the thing that Buddha identifies as subtle, subtle suffering, you know, often people um, think of it as, as, as happiness. Just like, you know, the, the addict who gets high on his, um, you know, on his uh, uh, drug, to him it's happiness. But he's addicted to a very um, substance which is destroying his happy life, he's destroying his family life, you know, he's making him steal and so forth. So many um, unfortunate aspects. But he's just, um, you know, grasping at the uh, the momentary experience of, of, you know, some sort of bliss or pleasure in his mind, and so for him, uh, it's happiness. But uh, you know, it's um, it's uh, you know the context. If you look at the proper context, then it's indeed his suffering. Or you can think about um, the Buddha's the Buddha's own life. You know, he was living uh, as a as a privileged member of the the royal family in this kingdom in uh, northern India, or perhaps it was in southern Nepal. Kapilavastu, what is it, what is it called? I think? Kapilavastu, anyway, his father was the, you know, the ruler of this kingdom. He had all the luxuries of the palace. But when, you know, he, um, he sort of emerged from his, um, you know, happy innocence of uh, youth, childhood and youth, into the maturity of adulthood, and he um, uh, sort of came across uh, more or less, you know, for the first time, the impact of old age uh, and sickness and death, you know, that was enough for him to see, oh, that life in the palace is all a waste of time. You know, all the life of the palace, which, you know, the ordinary people of the world would see as the most, most luxurious and the most comfortable and the most, you know, lovely of lives. He said, oh, that's just, um, uh, is just sort of a waste of time. It's just... Um, uh, it, it sickens me. I, I want to leave and, uh, you know, search for the truth. Why is it that people have to um, grow old, uh, get sick and die? And he just looking at the gross suffering of the world, you know, he was able to see then the subtle suffering of, uh, you know, living in the palace, not doing anything about uh, the challenge of the gross suffering, but just accepting it, you know, as part of life. And then that was, uh, you know, uh, he saw through the, the, the pleasures of palace life, rejected them, and uh, took to the life of a, of a spiritual seeker. So, um, what we see as happiness, you know, that kind of luxurious life, he saw as suffering, as a waste of time, you know, his, his precious human rebirth. So that wasn't his uh, cup of tea, that wasn't his precious cup of tea, he wanted precious human cup of tea, he wanted to go off. <laughs> And even though the life of uh, the spiritual seeker is a life of hardship, a life of, you know, dusty feet and, 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 and uh, you know, meditating under trees with the mosquitoes buzzing around you, 
that was okay. He was, he was um, you know, doing something worthwhile with his life. And uh, not just sort of, you know, uh, uh, luxuriating in, in the pleasures of wealth and power. And the last one, what was the last one? Um, uh, seeing uh, what does not have a self, seeing the selfless as having a self. Yeah, so this is the, 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 the biggest, um, you know, delusion of all and the most hard to understand, of course. So the big daddy of all delusions, the big daddy of all ignorance. This is where all the others take their, you know, this is the, the, the main route. And so why are, we in why are we born in a world like this at all, you know? Why are we born into a world that suffering goes on and on occurring? Why are we born with these bodies which are saying it's supposed to be, you know, uh, uh, subtle suffering? Yes, we're liable to all these pains and troubles. And, you know, somehow it's, it's an evolutionary advantage to feel pain. It seems like that. The way people who are experts on these subjects talk is like, if you don't have a pain response, like we have a very, you know, strong pain response in your system, then somehow you neglect to look after your body properly. And, uh, you know, you, you let your body get infected or, you know, you get wounds that you don't really treat properly. And so um, that's, um, you know, to, to your disadvantage. But when you've got a strong pain response, then, you know, it makes you, when you have a wound or an injury or, or an illness, it makes you do something to uh, recover from it as quickly as possible. So the pain response, even though it's very horrible and, you know, very, very unpleasant, we wish we didn't feel so much more, so much pain, even for a little tiny injury, it's so painful. But actually, that's in evolutionary terms, that's an advantage. You know, all those creatures that didn't have a strong pain response, like you know, of our species, say they all they all pass away, they die out, they don't they don't succeed in, in breeding the future generations. It's the ones who have a very sensitive pain response. They're the ones who who you know who bred successively and you know increased uh, the human population because it's such an advantage to have that pain response. So that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of body we've got. Why is it so crazy that the advantage of the good body is one that feels a lot of pain when it gets injured? So that's really strange, but it is um, apparently that's the way, you know, things have worked in the, in, in the evolution of a, you know, a successful mammal or whatever. So, um, in a, it's, it's ignorance grasping at ourselves. It's ignorance grasping at ourselves to inherently exist. That you know keeps us, uh, you know, turning in the wheel of samsara. Grasping at ourselves is 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 what um, um, keeps us here. Keeps us, um, you know, living in this sort of world of uh, I don't know what it is. You know, contamination or you know unskillful actions through misunderstanding the way things are and if you get that wisdom realizing selflessness realizing emptiness then you're released from that that, that uh, you know clinging you're released from your mistaken kind of a uh, oh if i have this thing it will really make me happy and uh, you know this is a real source of pleasure that's a real source of you know discomfort and, and, and displeasure so I really must have this one, really must get rid of that one. And you take everything in such a sort of an exaggerated way of following your uh, sort of the, the, the mistaken appearances of, of kind of, you know, things existing from their own side with their own power to give happiness and, or, or, or suffering. And you get all confused, you know. So it's, um, it's up to us to, you know, to, to penetrate down to this level of selflessness, emptiness. This is what Buddha taught over and over again, the ultimate truth. You know, and, and, and release yourself from that kind of you know, um, confusion of subject and object, and even at the on the level of, of ultimate truth of, of understanding uh, reality, let's say, as things, understanding what's um, uh, what is there when all the confusion is dissolved away. Well, there's nothing is there that is that has its own reality. Nothing is there. Uh, by way of its own power. Nothing is there that has any inherent existence. So that's, that's the marvelous discovery that, um, you know, all our um, uh, sort of conventional world that we are sort of dealing with as if that's the only side of reality, just the, just the conventional side of reality exists. You know, all of that is so provisional. It's so like, um, 
it, it's certainly there, but it's only there in dependence upon this cause and that circumstance, and this uh, way of looking at things, and that perspective and that observer. You know, so there's nothing has any reality of its own. Realizing that is supposed to be such a release and such a such a radical kind of revolution in our way of understanding things that um, you know that uh, it, it kind of um, just undercuts samsara, undercuts the whole basis of our suffering and dissatisfaction. So this is a, a, a kind of a wisdom that we really need to go for, really need, really need to understand, and that our Dharma centers. And I think this uh, this wisdom is taught over and over again. So that is definitely one of the four seals, you know. All um, phenomena are selfless. That's a third of the, of the three seals. So it's not one I'm going to concentrate on so much directly, but if we have time on the second day talking about Nibbana, then yes, we can try to have a meditation on that, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that sort of wisdom inside, of course. So we try to do that. Yeah. So that's some um, general introduction to the to the four seals, and uh, I'm going to talk, as I said, about about the first one especially, which is um, impermanence. All contaminated phenomena, sorry, all compounded phenomena, sorry, sorry, all compounded phenomena are impermanent. And then we'll 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 have a little bit of a, a, a think about that, and a little bit of meditation, let's say. So, um, what should we say? Well, first we should talk about um, compounded things, you see. Compounded things are all impermanent. So we should know a little bit about compounded things, and then we can talk a bit about uh, impermanent. So, um, compounded things, uh, and in some texts you'll find that translated as conditioned things. Last, um, last weekend I was talking and I was using the translation condition the phenomena. That seemed a more suitable for the text I was talking about last week of Nagarjuna and the, the, the Paleta. So you might find that translation condition things and you might find the translation composed things. So these are just, um, you know, different English translations for the same uh, Tibetan word, the same Sanskrit term. So why can't we all use the same term? Why can't all these translators just use the same word and we'll all be finding it much easier? Well, you know, it's difficult word to translate and people have got their own different ideas, haven't they? And they're obstinate people. I think, I'm not sure what the official um, FBMT translation is actually. FBMT has a, a list of, you know, preferred translation terms. So what is it for this one? Do check. I don't know, there is, the, we'll, we'll look it up, but, uh, Anyway, it doesn't really matter what, the, what you just explain what the word means. And the compounder phenomena in Sanskrit is samskirta, samskirta. So it means together and made. So something that is put together. So compounder phenomena sounds about right, really. Um, it's not, don't think of it as being made of parts. It's more like it's made out of such and such and such causes and conditions. So it's, it's supposed to you know, convey the idea of being put together out of causes and conditions. So most things are put together out of parts too, but here it's like, you know, things arise through a combination of, uh, of, uh, of causes, combination of circumstances. So that's, that's the kind of phenomena we're talking about here. Are all phenomena like that? Well, no, not in, not in our, um, not in our sort of, um, you know, Tibetan style of, of, of analysis, not in the style of analysis of um, the uh, type of Buddhism we are studying here, which is, you know, the Nalanda tradition of Buddhism. So they do allow um, permanent phenomena too. Anybody give me an example of permanent phenomena? Space. Yeah, and course space. Aha, uh -huh. my secretary has just um, put a note on my table. And it says the official FPMT translation is compositional phenomenal. 
compositional phenomena. There we are. Also conditioned. Also conditioned the phenomena. Yeah. So I'm not going against the FBMT official translation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so some phenomena are uh, unconditioned, some phenomena are not, you know, directly produced from cause and conditions. So uncompounded space is one of them, nirvana, emptiness. These phenomena are, you know, are, are kind of um, not directly in the flow of cause and conditions. Um, those are the big ticket ones, the big items, yeah? I say big ticket items like the fancy, you know, the most important emptiness in nirvana, they are, you know, they are are kind of you know permanent but if you want a simpler one you can just say well the absence of a hundred dollar bill on my table the absence of a hundred dollar bill on this table in front of me or the absence of a hundred dollar bill in my hand yeah so that's a permanent phenomenon you see there's no substance there the, the absence of the dollar bill there aren't any atoms you know or, or there's no mental substance or anything like that that could be like in this stream of cause and effects it's just an absence right so it's like, you can see how that's like imputed by the mind, like, oh, well, look at his hand then. Is, is there something there that's green and square? And well, no. So we know there is no under dollar bill sticking to his hand, yeah? So you, you eliminate, you look at, you think dollar bill and they'll eliminate it. And then you've got absence of dollar bill. We should know, it's true, you know? It's not like, it doesn't come to mind. Of course you can know the absence. But it's, it's, it, there's, no, there's nothing there to be in the stream of cause and effect, is it? It's just like an abstract phenomena, abstract. So, you know, there are some phenomena which aren't you know, sort of subject to uh, arising and lasting and ceasing due to the um, you know, workings of cause and effect. The condition of phenomena, the, the compositional things, they are, you know, those that are under the power of causes and effects those that are coming come into being and last or you know get destroyed through the power of cause and effect so those are the conditioned phenomena so that's most of the phenomena we're dealing with in the world right most of the phenomena you know that we encounter the objects of our desire the objects of our aversion and our emotions and our feelings they're all impermanent and the more we remember that the better impermanent means they you know they just arise and then they pass away and then that, that, that's some um, you know, that, that's the message of this uh, first uh, seal. What arises you know, in, in this world you know, has to pass away again. So what are the benefits of remembering that? Okay, well, I'm going to leave that one to you. At this point, um, we could have a breakout session, uh, Jason or Lynn. Just 10 minutes, or you know, not more than that, just to try and... Um, think about the benefits of remembering impermanence impermanence and death right there is a there is a one of the documents i sent you which is uh called saturday questions or something maybe it's got two questions on it is that right jason and uh anyway it's a simple question so what are the benefits of um remembering impermanence and death yeah so I think most of you are kind of some experience of Buddhism, so I don't really need to explain much more than that. Uh, but you know, like people who are worldly people, they don't like to remember impermanence and death. Certainly my parents, okay, they saved up for their old age and they, when they were old and infirm, they did have a pension. So they were thinking about when they would become impermanent and, and not able to look after themselves very well. They wouldn't be able to work, they need, would need money. So they did have good pension. But then when you talk to them about death, well, you couldn't really. I mean, I was looking after my parents when they were, you know, for the last years of their life. They never wanted to talk about death, which kind of surprised me. And it, they, they went to church, you know, they were kind of people who um, were uh, sort of uh, had some sort of religious inspiration. But they just, they wouldn't talk about, they didn't want to talk about in the death and that I'm going to die now later or sooner or, you know even when the minds were still um, quite clear so the death just wasn't a subject that they wanted to talk about not a subject of conversation but a buddhist you know somebody's trying to be a practitioner somebody's really trying to use this precious human rebirth to the full 
they should think about death, they should meditate. So what's the benefit? Death and impermanence, it's gross impermanence, you know. So what is the benefit to our peace of mind and the health, mental health, um, in, in remembering those things? So that's the subject of this short breakout session. And uh, 10 minutes, uh, you're, you're splitting people into twos, into just pairs, I think, just for max of 10 minutes and then come back together. Okay. See you later.